I never thought of myself as a photographer. I never liked photography very well. Um, I never felt any allegiance to its so-called history. And to this day, I don't really believe that it has a history. I made photographs because photography was the simplest, most direct way of recording something. I worked in photography because it was the most conventional. It was a form of visual notation that has, of course, since been uh, supplanted by, by other things, by video, whatever. But uh, at that time, it was probably the most simple and, in a certain way, unpretentious way to work. Anyone can take pictures. What's difficult is thinking about them, organizing them, trying to use them, montage them in some way so that some, some, some meaning can be constructed out of them. And that's really where the work begins. I was born and was living in the middle of one of the most rapidly urbanizing areas in the world, Southern California in the post-war period. Uh, you could watch the changes take place. I mean, it was, it was astonishing what, what had... And a new world was being born there, perhaps not a very pleasant world, but one that was, um, it was simply this new homogenized American environment that was marching across the land and being exported. And it seemed no one, no one wanted to confront this. It was invisible, and it was invisible in in the sense it was simply material that people filtered out. People pretended not to see it. I was looking for the things that were most typical, uh, the things that are the most quotidian, everyday, unremarkable, and trying to represent them in a way that was the most quotidian and everyday and unremarkable. And I certainly wanted my work to look like anyone could do it. I didn't want it to have a style. I wanted it to look as mute and as distant, uh, as a, to appear to be as objective as possible. Of course, it's not objective. I tried very hard in this work not to show my point of view. I tried to think of myself as, as an anthropologist from, uh, from a different solar system, someone coming and simply recording the events that transpired in front of their camera. What I was interested in more was the phenomena of the place, not the thing itself, but the effect of it, the effect of this kind of urbanization, the effect of this kind of living, the effect of this kind of building. What kind of, what kind of people would, uh, would come out of this? What kind, of, what kind of new world was being built here? Was it a world people could live in, really? I became even more and more interested in, in things that were marginalized, in things that were really obscene, that is, in the, in the literal sense of the word, things that were, were off of the scene, that were, were never observed, were never spoken about, um, because they were so ordinary and quotidian, because they were so commonplace, because they were in some way disgusting, um, because they reminded us of our mortality. I mean, from that, from that work, I began to work in a place where there, there was no construction at all. It was just a uh, wasteland. In 1989, I began to think about other ways of working, other possibilities. Um, I became much more responsive to the idea that, that this work could be social in much more direct ways than it had been in the past. Starting in 1989, I began to make a series of, and a very small series of uh, scenes of various cities, probably not wholly generic, probably not cities that can be confused with anywhere in the world, but places in European cities that, that simply contain the idea of city, 
the generic European city. The generic night pictures have a, have a, very, have a kind of strange conceptual base. I thought of them in terms of a piece made about 25 years ago by Bruce Nauman. The piece consists of a, <clears throat> a room, a freestanding room, where you enter and you can hear a very, very faint sound coming from the walls. And as you move close to the wall and you approach, this whispering voice, and it says, get out of my room, get out of my room, get out of my room. And I, I, I thought of these pieces in very much that way. I wanted to make the, these pieces are done in cibachrome, they're large, they are as seductive as I can make them. They're frighteningly seductive, kitschily seductive. At the same time, I wanted something in the content that was absolutely contrary to that. I wanted, I wanted these things to have, the, have some of the power of, of seduction and repulsion. There are a number of works where I've simply, not really combined, but joined two views of the city together. There seems to be a relation between these two images. But I, li I like that it raises this question, which I think is a very irritating question. Is there really a relation between these images? Or is the relation completely arbitrary? Are they related only because of proximity? Because they're physically next to each other? Or is there a relation? Or could any two images function that way? Towards the end of the 1980s, I became fascinated by some of the aspects of the, the emerging electronic technologies. Um, the machine looked like nothing at all. But in fact, these kind of machines, the computers, um, which are about as interesting looking as refrigerators, in fact, are doing the real work of the world. As I worked with technology, I became increasingly aware of the uses of that technology in social manipulation, combined with an unrelenting surveillance of the population. In Ronda Dinui, I tried to make a piece that would recreate, metaphorically, some of, some of that experience. Well, the piece is composed of 12 panels and they have an overall dimension of two meters high by 12 meters long. The panels are cibachrome prints. They were either taken from video surveillance cameras or they were printed to look as though they may have been. Some of the panels are very, very high definition, very photographic, very tactile. Other panels are extremely low definition, so much so that, in fact, each one of the panels demands a different viewing distance to gestalt the content of the image. Uh, there is no one fixed viewing position. To look at this piece, one would have to move close and far, close and far, uh, and essentially be, be manipulated by the piece itself. It's never certain in this piece, after all, who is, who is, is, is the victim and uh, who is the perpetrator, who is being watched, who is watching. The second piece that derived out of the study of the sites of technology was a piece called Docile Bodies. I took, I took the title from uh, Michel Foucault, and it was an investigation of medical technologies, but more precisely an investigation of the relationship between the patient and the, the health provider, the doctor, the hospital, the condition of total reliance and total helplessness, total docility of the patient in face of the overwhelming power of medical science and technology which raises certain, certain interesting questions. It's absolutely benign. Lives are saved. People are healed. At the same time, it's probably until, until we have a way of reading people's minds, it's one of the most intrusive procedures one can imagine. But it's an intrusive procedure with a benign end. But can we imagine a less benign end to this? In 1989, I learned that the Newport Harbor Art Museum, the museum in the little city I grew up in, was going to make a bid for world-class status by having an 
a new building built by Renzo Piano. I offered myself to make a document, a, a survey of the, the new site of the building. I, I thought of the history of the city and I was reminded of a story that my father told me when I was very young about his involvement in a murder trial, which was at the time the longest murder trial, the longest criminal trial in American history. When I proposed the project, the Newport Harbor Art Museum, uh, it, it, was, it wasn't what they'd expected, and uh, it was in due course refused. But it wasn't until several years later that I had some opportunity to realize it. It was first realized in an exhibition and book, and then then again later as a, as a CD-ROM, which is fine with me. I did, I'm not so terribly interested in, or I'm very pleased with the fact that this project doesn't have a definitive form. The, the core of it is the narrative. And so it's interesting to me to see different ways that that narrative can be treated, and treated as, as, a, as an art object, treated as a, a journalistic report, um, treated as a bookwork. The, the, those are various containers that, that can be used to contain this story. I think the deaths in Newport is interesting, perhaps not uniquely interesting, but, but interesting in the same sense that, that Rashomon is interesting, is that we learn all the facts, we learn from very different points of view. In the end, nothing can be ascertained about this. In this, it's not so very different from the work with technology. I think I spoke about to photograph the sites of technology is to reveal nothing. The more that's seen, the less is revealed. The truth, if there is truth, is unapproachable and unknowable. There is no fixed form for this piece. The presentation of the work, the, um, the encounter with the viewer, in a sense, creates the work. I don't think that there's any one single reading to, to my work. I think there are many readings. The readings change as, as the projects change. I remember a remark that Jean Nouvel made. He said, you don't give the same answer to different questions. <laughs>